وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith. In our previous episodes, we discussed various acts that go against one's worship of Allah or one's confession and testimony of La ilaha illallah. In today's episode, we're going to look at the same aspect but from a different angle and we're going to prove and demonstrate the extreme and meticulous care with which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam protected the various aspects of Tawheed. Stay with us. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the protection that the Prophet ﷺ gave to Tawheed or to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're going to prove that he cut off all doors leading to shirk. And the care and the concern that he demonstrated to ensure that Allah and only Allah is worshipped. Now, it goes beyond saying, it goes without saying that the Prophet ﷺ explained to us the entire religion of Islam. In one tradition narrated in Ibn Majah, number 5, the Prophet ﷺ said that indeed I swear by Allah, I have left you upon the shining path. I have left you upon the clear road. Its night is like its day. No one can be distracted, no one can deviate from this road except the one who is destroyed. The meaning of this hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ has given us all the information we need to know. The path is straight, the path is clear. There are no stumbling blocks on the path. There is no darkness that will ever happen to us. Nobody will deviate from this path except that he wants destruction. Not that he doesn't find the guidance, not that he doesn't know where the road is. What does a light do? It tells you how to get from point A to point B. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling us clearly that I have left you upon the shining path. The path and the road is clear. There is no darkness, no confusion about it. After narrating this hadith, Abu Darda, the companion who narrated it, he said, Sadaqa wallah. I swear by Allah, the Prophet ﷺ has told the truth. Verily, he has left us upon the shining path. Its night and its day are equivalent. So Abu Darda, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, reinforced this as well. And there is no doubt that the most important thing that the Prophet ﷺ was sent with was that of Tawheed. So we can find many examples in which the Prophet ﷺ blocks all roads to shirk and demonstrates that only Allah is worthy of worship. And in our lecture today, we will mention perhaps 12 or 15 such examples where the Prophet ﷺ has blocked off all roads that lead to shirk or associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of the prohibitions that the Prophet ﷺ gave was that he prohibited building mosques over graves. Because this is one of the primary roads that leads to shirk. To build a mosque over a grave will lead to grave worship. Just like it led in the people of Nuh as well. And we discussed this in a previous episode. Where the basis of shirk was when the people of Nuh, they built graves of the pious people and they built it inside their masjids. And they built icons over these graves. And slowly but surely over the generations, they started worshipping these idols and icons instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one narration, Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she narrated to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the beautiful churches she had seen in Abyssinia. She was one of those companions that had immigrated to Abyssinia and then come back to Medina and Mecca. So she was telling the Prophet ﷺ how beautiful and large and magnificent those churches were. The Prophet ﷺ said that those people, whenever a pious person died amongst them, 
they would build a mosque over his grave and carve images of them. Therefore, they are the worst of mankind in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The worst of mankind. Because they worship other than Allah. The point is, how did this worship start? They built mosques. They built temples. They built monasteries, places of worship over the graves of their pious people and saints. So because of this, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us to build mosques over graves. Another factor is that he also forbade burying dead people inside a mosque, which is the opposite. You have a masjid already built, you have a mosque already built, it is prohibited to bury that dead person inside of a masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said, while he was on his deathbed, he said, O oh Allah, do not make my grave an idol that is worshipped. Do not make my grave an idol that is worshipped. This is narrated in the, in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from burying our dead and making their graves icons and symbols and idols instead of Allah, to be worshipped instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, he even prohibited us from worshipping Allah at the place of a grave. We are not allowed to pray where there is a grave in front of us. Even if it's in a masjid or a graveyard or anywhere, if there is a grave there, you, you cannot play, pray at that location. We're not talking about praying to the grave, that's obviously shirk. We're talking about offering your salah, your prayer, dhuhr or asr or maghrib or isha or fajr, you pray it at that location, it is completely prohibited. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once a person came to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to go to a place called Bawana. Bawana was the name of a place. And I want to sacrifice a camel there. I have made a promise to Allah to sacrifice a camel at this place called Bawana. So the Prophet ﷺ asked this person, was there an idol that was worshipped at this place during the times of Jahiliyyah? Or was that a place of the religious celebrations? The person replied, no, that wasn't the case. This is not a religious, this is not a holy site. So then the Prophet ﷺ said, if that is the case, then fulfill your vow. You're allowed to sacrifice at this location. So in this hadith, he prohibited Muslims from worshipping at the holy places where there's icons, religious sites of other people. And we also said he prohibited praying in a graveyard because he authentically said that it is not allowed to pray in a graveyard, a maqbara, a graveyard. So the location where a person prays to Allah is also relevant. It cannot be a graveyard. It cannot be a religious holy temple or site of another group or another religion. Because when you say your prayers there, someone might think that you are worshipping uh, worshiping that grave or that idol. That is why he even asked, was there an idol before during the times of Jahiliyyah? He didn't say, is there an idol now? Of course it is not permitted to pray if there is an idol in front of you. He asked in the past tense, was there an idol in the days of Jahiliyyah? Was this considered to be a holy place? A blessed place for other religions? If it was, then don't say your prayers there. If that site is considered religious and holy by other religions, then by you going there, you are implicitly worshipping their gods. Even though you might be saying your salah to Allah. So it is prohibited to pray at such locations as well. In fact, not just the, the place, the timings as well. The Prophet ﷺ forbade us to pray to Allah at three timings. Because it is narrated that he said, that it is prohibited to pray while the sun is rising, sunrise, while it is at its zenith, its top, its apex, high noon, and while it is setting. These three times. The Prophet ﷺ forbade us to pray at these three times. Why? Because he said, these are the timings that the other people worship it. The worshippers of the sun, these are the timings that they worship the sun. When the sun is rising, that is when they prostrate to it. And when it is right at its zenith, high noon, they also prostrate to it. And when it is setting at Maghrib time, or before Maghrib, excuse me, that time as well they worship it. So during these three times, he prohibited us from offering our own prayers to Allah in order to close the road of shirk so that we ourselves don't fall into the shirk that other nations fell into. So the Prophet ﷺ outlined the places that we're not allowed to pray and he also outlined the timings that we're not allowed to pray. He also prohibited the Muslims from excessively praising him. Because excessive praise, raising a person above his status, is one of the primary ways of shirk, especially a holy person. Because it's so easy to give him more than he deserves. 
The Prophet ﷺ himself said, as narrated by Bukhari, don't excessively praise me like the Christians did to Jesus, the son of Mary. Notice he said excessive praise. We praise him, yes. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We praise him as much as Allah allows us to praise him. We say about him whatever Allah and his messenger want us to say about him. We defend him, we defend his honor, we fight on his behalf. We will give our very lives to defend him and his sunnah. But we don't raise him above his place. We don't make him a god besides Allah. Therefore the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam blocked this path. And he said, do not excessively praise me as Isa or the Christians prayed Isa. Rather say, I am the servant of Allah and His Messenger. Put me in my right place. Once again, these are the statements, these are the phrases of our Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He himself told us, do not excessively praise me. He also forbade the companions to stand up in his presence. Because he said, this is over-exaltation of a created being. So the Prophet sallallahu once when he was praying, he was praying while sitting down because he was injured. All the Sahaba behind him prayed standing up. So when he finished the prayer, he said, you are about to imitate the practices of the Romans and the Persians because they stand up in the presence of their leaders. Do not do so. Do not do so. Once again, he himself prohibited the companions, do not do so. Because this is over-exaltation. And this is while he was alive, he prohibited them from doing so. Can you believe this authentic hadith in Bukhari exists and yet we have people now who supposedly stand up and think that the Prophet is in their presence while he is now passed away in the mercy of his Lord. The irony is while he was alive, he prohibited the Muslims from standing up in his presence. And now we have various groups, ideologies, methodologies. They all stand up at a certain time and place and they think that the Prophet is in their midst. Yet he himself prohibited this act. We'll take a short break and we'll continue on this very same theme of the Prophet Sallallahu protection of Tawheed and of his closing the doors to all types of shirk. Stay tuned. <laughs> trying to get together, but all their efforts were in vain because of ignoring or turning away from this great foundation. We see many people coming to the way of truth, following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but later on, they get off track. What is the reason behind that? Unity is a result, it's not a cover-up. We have to be united from inside. And Allah made this clear in the Quran when He said, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ Welcome back. We were discussing the fact that the Prophet ﷺ protected Tawheed and he cut off the roots of shirk so that shirk would never form in any type of place or circumstance. Of the proofs of this is that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited Muslims from making images, from making statues, idols, icons, and even from painting and drawing any type of real image. The Prophet ﷺ said that the people who will be punished the most on the Day of Judgment are those who try to create or try to imitate the creation of Allah. Those who try to imitate the creation of Allah. Once again, Sahih Bukhari, this hadith is there. He said that on the Day of Judgment, they will be resurrected and Allah will challenge them. Breathe life into what you drew. Breathe life into what you created. It is prohibited to make icons and statues, 3D images of living beings because this leads to shirk and that is why if you ponder over where did shirk and how did shirk start when images were made of pious people Nuh the people of Nuh what did they do they built images 3D icons statues of people and while they built them when they built them no shirk occurred someone will say well I have just this object in my house I don't worship it well the same thing existed in the time of Nuh they built these images of people and they placed them there, but they didn't worship them. Until generations came. And slowly but surely they were taken as 
God besides Allah. And the same occurred in the, before the time of the Prophet ﷺ as well. That these idols and images, initially they were not worshipped, but slowly but surely, they became, began to be worshipped besides Allah. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ cut off this evil from its very root. Do not build images, do not carve out statues and stones, and even do not draw with your hand physical living bodies. Yes, you can draw the trees, you can draw the mountains, you can paint streams and rivers and a beautiful sunset. Yes, these are not living objects. But wherever there's life, an animal, a human being, it is prohibited to imitate the creation of Allah, whether it be by painting or sculpture, or whether it be by a 3D statue. The Prophet ﷺ also forbade undertaking a religious journey to a religious site except for one of the three masajids. Because one of the ways that shirk occurs is when you take a certain location as a blessed location when it is not. The graves of pious saints. How many places exist in the Muslim world where people go to these graves believing that these people in these graves will give them their needs, which is the essence of shirk. You are directing your love, your fear, your hope, your prayer to these objects, created objects instead of Allah. And they believe that these graves, these mausoleums, are blessed in and of themselves. Therefore, they pay money to travel. They undertake long journeys to go to visit these graves. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ cut off this evil from its very root. He said, do not travel except to one of three masajids. No one should undertake a journey except to one of three masajids. The Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca, the Kaaba, the masjid, my masjid in Medina, the Prophet's masjid in Medina, and the Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. These three places are the only holy places that Allah and His Messenger have told us are blessed and holy on the face of this earth. We should not undertake a journey to any other place, believing that that is a religious and a blessed place, except for these three. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that these are the only three places. There is no mausoleum, no specific masjid, no place on the face of this earth where we should travel to go see, believing that it is a holy place except for these three. Now obviously if we're in the vicinity of a famous masjid, or if we are in the place where uh, you know, some, some historical thing occurred, obviously where there's no graves and no icons, then we can go visit it if we're in this city. Because we're not undertaking a journey from one city to another. And we, under, we visit this place believing that it is not holy in and of itself, it's just something historical. We, we, we go there knowing that, for example, this is the masjid built by you know, a famous general of the past or a companion even or something of this nature. As long as there's no graves. If there's a grave, we cannot pray in that masjid. Otherwise, historical masjids, once we come to a city, we, should, we can see them, no problem. But if we go visit them, we should believe in our hearts that these masjids in and of themselves are not holy. They are not blessed. They are just historical in nature. The only blessed masjids, the only blessed localities on the face of this earth are these three masajids. The Prophet ﷺ also forbade us from imitating the practices of the Jews and Christians. He said in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, he narrated that he is not one of us who imitates others. Do not imitate the Jews and the Christians. What do I say by imitating? I mean following practices that are specific to them, specific to them. For example, celebrating Christmas. This is specific to the Christians. Okay? Or doing any other type of act which is unique to them. I don't mean, for example, wearing pant and shirt or, or doing things which all of mankind does. These are issues which are not specific to one particular religion. What is prohibited is to do an act, whether it be like wearing clothes that are, for example, the, the, the clothes that a priest wears or the clothes that a monk wears, specific clothing. We cannot wear those clothes because when someone sees us, he will think that we are a monk or a priest. Likewise, to do specific acts which every religion does, like eating of the bread or something, or, or any type of specific religious symbol, wearing a cross, any type of thing which is specific to a religion, it is prohibited for us to do. Because like the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever imitates the people is one of them. So one second, imitation means following a practice, a custom, a culture, a statement, anything which is unique to that specific religion. This is what I mean by imitating. The Prophet ﷺ also commanded us to level all raised graves. In other words, when we are in command, again this applies when we have power, when we're in the government or we have power to change it. This doesn't mean that when we don't have the power we do, we, we do things we shouldn't do. No. When we're in positions of power, 
or when we are in charge of something and we have the authority to do something, then of the things that the Prophet ﷺ told us to do is to make sure that there are no raised graves. Graves which have mausoleums built over them or structures around them. The Prophet ﷺ commanded Ali ibn Abi Talib that go forth, he was going on an expedition, and he said any raised grave that you find, level it. What does it mean level it? It means make it down to the level of the earth. Make sure there's no structure or icon or mausoleum built around it. Because once again, this is one of the main stepping stones to shirk. Look around you though, in the Muslim world. Unfortunately, you find so many places where mausoleums have been built. Huge, magnificent structures. Magnificent structures built over graves. And when you go there, you find that blatant shirk occurs. People make dua. People even prostrate. Do sajda. Muslims. Claiming to say, La ilaha illallah. In fact, I remember myself, I visited a, a certain masjid in a, a Muslim country. And they had not only built a mausoleum, not only were tying strings for blessings, they had actually built a place to pray. Sajda. Like you say your prayer, to that person of the grave. And this is supposedly a masjid. You look at it from outside, you see the minaret, okay, you see the dome, everything. And when you walk inside, you find nobody's facing the qibla, they are facing that grave. Or they are doing tawaf around this grave, going around the grave. Acts of blatant shirk. Acts which contradict, which nullify your testimony of La ilaha illallah. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from even building mausoleums, building anything over the grave. A true Muslim graveyard, you should only see mounds of dirt or sand. That's it. The Prophet ﷺ also forbade us from saying certain phrases which give the impression that others are equivalent to Allah. Of these phrases is the phrase that uh, whatever Allah wills and whatever you will will occur. Okay? Suppose for example that a certain person is in charge of something and it is his decision to do whatever, what, what he wants to do. So if you tell him, well okay, whatever Allah wills and whatever you will, will occur. The phrasing has made it appear that you have made this person equivalent to Allah. Therefore, this phrasing is not allowed. What you should say, like the Prophet ﷺ said, is whatever Allah wills and then whatever you will. Your will is underneath the will of Allah. Whatever Allah wills will occur and then your will. In other words, if your will has been approved by Allah, it will occur. The point is though, he even forbade certain phrases. Certain phrases which might lead to shirk. These are just some of the ways in which the Prophet ﷺ ensured that all of the roads and all of the doors to shirk were blocked. And in fact, it is no exaggeration to state that the entire life and seerah and biography of the Prophet ﷺ was meant for this purpose. This is why he was sent to establish La ilaha illallah. This is why he was sent. So he gave us the complete message that we need to know. There is not a single thing that we need to know except that he has told us about it. If you can hand me, Akhi, Mu'jim al Kabir of Tabarani, Volume 2, in a beautiful narration, the Prophet ﷺ has told us how complete is the religion of Islam. And remember, Mu'jim al Kabir of Tabarani, it is a, one of the largest collections of hadith, and the author, he lived for over a hundred years. He lived for a very long life. In this book, it is narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, there is not a single thing, this is hadith number 1647, there is not a single matter that brings you closer to paradise, except that I have told you about it. And there is not a single matter that brings you closer to the fire of hell, except that I have warned you against it. Not a single matter. The religion of Islam is complete. And that is why one of the companions stated, that the Prophet ﷺ passed away and there was not a single bird flapping its wings in the sky except that our Prophet ﷺ had told us what we need to know about that bird. The religion of Islam is complete. And its essence is La ilaha illallah. And the Prophet ﷺ was sent to establish this kalima. So he succeeded in that. And if only we as Muslims would follow what, we, what he prohibited us from doing. If we would follow the prohibitions and the commandments, if we would act as Muslims, then we would not have to face the troubles of shirk. With this, we come to the conclusion of another episode of Fundamentals of Faith. We hope to see you next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.